Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back. And this is part number 3b of the Canvas protocol. In previous episodes we have looked at the physical installation, we have looked at the cabling, we've looked at the electrical signals and we already started looking at the frame structures that a Canvas controller generates. Now we're going to look on a mock-up here and see how that structure is actually happening and how we can decode it with an oscilloscope. And it's not going to be all that easy, but you'll see what I mean. We'll at the end also include the three remaining frames that we haven't talked about yet, which is the remote transmission request and the error frames and the overload frame. Before we start, I need to make something clear because somebody made a comment on part three where I could have used some confusing terms. And when I explained that the CAN ID is identifying a device, I was not uh, um, referring to a module. I was a device in a very generic term. A device could be an RPM value, it could be a pressure value. So for clarity, um, the CAN ID is not your ECU. It is not an address of a module. It is actually a value for an entity. For instance, uh, if you're looking at the top of the slides, uh, you could have a electronics control unit of whatever sort it is, an ECU, TCU, whatever. And it may be getting RPMs and temperature values and pressure values and so on. So many different values you could get either from sensors or received from somewhere else or calculated. And it may want to send this out over the CAN controller to other modules. And to do so, it's going to use a CAN ID for RPM plus the actual data of the RPMs. And it's going to use a CAN ID for etc plus the data and it will do the same for temperature and pressure and so on and it's going to send that information to the CAN controller who will embed it inside the CAN frame. So this is what I wanted to explain in part number three under the CAN ID. So thanks for pointing that out that it wasn't all that clear. So hopefully by this uh, I made that clear. So now we can start actually continuing uh, to actually work on the mock-up and show you how you can decode these frames. So without any further ado, let's start with the mock-up. So folks, this is the setup that I've created and we'll look in a second on how it is on the breadboard. But in essence, I have two CAN bus controllers, uh, CAN controller one, CAN bus controller number two. They're connected with a CAN bus itself, CAN high, CAN low, and I have an oscilloscope showing the trace that we capture while we're sending messages. The dotted yellow lines are identifying my control unit, basically. This could be your ECU, could be your TCU. And the Canvas controller 1 in that yellow box is actually the one which is going to create the envelope for the letter which will be sent by your microcontroller. It is the microcontroller on your car, be it the ECU, TCU, whatever it is, that is going to generate the CAN ID. It's going to say how long the message will be and it will provide the actual message. So keep in mind that it's the CAN ID is not a node on the network, not at all. The CAN ID refers, for instance, to RPM, to oil pressure. And you can imagine that a ECU can send many different CAN IDs out because it looks at many different things. And it's the CAN ID that will be transferred from the microcontroller into the Canvas controller and the canvas controller will inject that into the envelope. I also have a laptop here, uh, or a Mac in this case, where I'm running the code on, the code to drive actually uh, the microcontroller, but also the code to generate the messages and to define how long the messages will be and to define the data format of the canvas itself. So let's have a look on how that looks in practice. And then we dig into the uh, an explanation and a decode of the trace on the oscilloscope. So this is our mock-up and consisting out of two Canvas controllers. They are connected with our Canvas wire. I have the oscilloscope hooked up to the can high and to the can low, and you can see the traces right there on the oscilloscope. And we have a microcontroller which is driving the CAN controller. So this microcontroller is going to send messages towards the microcontroller which will then 
take the message and send it over the wire to the other side. I also have a Mac here, which is connected to the microcontroller because we need to load up the uh, control registers on the CAN bus controllers. And I have a little program here that is actually doing that. And I'm gonna show you where the ID is on this on the scope. But it's a little bit hard on the scope, so I'm gonna take a picture of the scope and then I will import it into a um, PowerPoint slide so we can actually dissect that actual trace. So we're going to start sending messages towards the Canvas controller through the microcontroller and you can actually see right here what we're going to send. We're going to send a CAN ID in hexadecimal of 388 and it's a datagram and we have 8 bytes for the actual message and the message is actually right here. So this is what we're going to send and then we'll dissect this on the oscilloscope. So let me load that up and then we'll see what happens. So loading it. On this side on the console we can see how the load is going. So Canvas is ready and of course it's now running. But the message sent has failed because the far end responder is not responding with the proper ACK uh, because I have no microcontroller on it. But that's okay. At least we can capture the trace on the oscilloscope. So now it's time to look at the actual data frame, the one that we captured with the oscilloscope. And we have used the CAN ID 388. And I just placed the structure on the CAN frame uh, on the screen so we can double check on that. So let me just show you that. So here is the code that I'm running on the Mac. And what we're doing is we are sending 388 in hex. That's the identifier that the CAN controller will inject in the envelope. We also tell it that it's a RTR of zero, meaning that this is a standard data frame. And that field will go right there in the RTR. And then we also telling it that the data field will be eight bytes long. And then we have the actual message and the message is here. This is the message that will go into the data field. Remember I said eight bytes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Again, it's in hex and 11 means basically 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1 counting from the most significant bit. But don't worry, you'll see that in a minute. So I expect to see a trace on the oscilloscope that would reflect what I'm sending. And this is the trace we will get. Now, it's not that easy to decode this trace. But let us zoom in and then we can try to figure out, do we find the SOF? Do we find the identifier, the 388, RTR, control and data? All right, so let's have a look. All right, so pretty busy slide, but hopefully uh, I will be able to explain it. We have the can high right here and it's pulsing up and down. And we have the can low, which is pulsing lo down and up, right? So remember a zero on the can bus means there is a voltage difference between can high and can low. And a 1 on the bus is there is no difference between can high and can low. Now, for reasons of visibility, I've separated the two lines a bit, but this line and that line should be on top of each other. Okay, so, but it's just to make it a little bit more clear. So let's start. We know that a frame starts with a soft start of frame, and that is basically a zero. So can high will toggle up, can low will toggle down, and indeed, this is what we see, a zero. After the SOF, we have the identifier. Now, we did say that the identifier is 388. And in hex 388 is 00010001110 in binary. Right? So this is 8, this is 8, and this is 3. So we should find this back, really, on the oscilloscope. So let's have a look. So we're looking first for the zero. Well, guess what? This is the first zero after the soft. Then we have a one. Can is low. We have a one. Can is low. We have a one. And then we have zero, a zero, a zero, a one, a zero, a zero, and a zero. 
So what we see here is actually the ID 388. So what we're sending to the canvas control is actually being injected in the envelope and we find it back on the bus itself with the, with the oscilloscope. But as you can see, it's not always that easy on the oscilloscope to read this out. So that's why I injected it into a PowerPoint slide. Now, the next field that should come along is the RTR, Remote Transmission Request, that is a zero, identifying that we are sending a data frame. Well, look, zero right here, right? So now let's look at the control field. Now, the control field should contain, first of all, an identifier, which is telling us that the ID is either 11 or 29 bits. If it's a zero, it's 11 bits and indeed it's a zero and we know this is 11 bits we can count them then the control should also have a delimiter which should be this zero and then the control field should identify the length of the data field in terms of bytes and it should be eight because we did say it should be eight right here so if i look for eight it's zero 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 one this is eight but then all in a sudden we got this fat one in here where is this coming from? Because the control field is only supposed to be uh, six bits wide. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm having seven bits in my control field. Something isn't right, but it is right. Why? Well, see how many leading zeros we have here. One, two, three, four, five. And if you remember when I talked about the synchronization, the canvas controller will inject a stuffed bit of opposite polarity or opposite value based on the preceding five um, bits. So if you have five times a zero, it's gonna inject a one bit. If you have five times a one, it's gonna inject a zero bit. Now in our case, we got five times a zero, so it's injecting a one. Now this bit will be ignored basically by the receiving canvas controller so in essence we can also ignore it so we have zero zero one zero 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 so six bits so that makes absolute sense now let's look at the data field well we know the data we're going to send is eight bytes and the first uh, byte will be one one two two three three four four five five six six seven seven and eight eight so that's in total is eight bytes so let's look at the first one, 1-1. One, one. All right, and we know this is coming immediately after the control field, right? Uh, this is where it starts. So here we go. Um, 0, 0, 0, 1. That is exactly the first one. But again, we've got a fat one here. Why? Well, again, the same stuffing principle. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 consecutive zeros so we need to stuff a bit in. Again, that will be removed by the receiving canvas uh, controller, so we don't have to worry about it. But you have to keep it in mind once you start decoding these signals. Then let's look for the next one, right? Which is the second one right here. So that is zero, 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 0001. Now that makes sense. Now let's look at the second byte. It should be 2222. 22. So 0012, zero, zero, that's a 2. 0010, zero, 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 that's a 2 as well. So this together makes the data in hex 22. This together makes the data 11. And I can continue, but I'm not going to continue. Uh, but you can do it if you want. But this proves that the canvas is working as I have explained. And hopefully this helped you a bit. I know this is fairly deep down but this is the kind of stuff you would have to do if you want to decode the canvas yourself and you can imagine on a very busy canvas in a car this is going to be pretty hard to do so either you have a can analyzer or a computer that sorts it out for you because just doing visually as we've done here uh, it's difficult and this brings us to the remaining frames we haven't talked about yet the first frame is the remote request frame and the remote request frame is basically a node on the network that is needing a can ID information field and it doesn't have that. For instance, the instrument cluster needs to know the RPMs. So it's going to send out a remote request frame requesting anybody on the bus to send the RPMs and it's going to use the RPM can ID 
for that purpose. The next one is what we call the error frame. Any node on the network that is detecting a framing error or a CRC error will immediately transmit a frame error frame onto the bus so everybody knows that there is a error. And then at last we have the overload frame. This is a frame being sent by a network node which is kind of overloaded and needs more time. So now let's dig in a little bit into the structures and then we should be almost finished with the CAN. So let's look at a remote transmission request frame. And as an example, we have an instrument cluster, we have an ECU and a TCU, and there are more modules on the bus, it doesn't really matter. And at some moment in time, the ECU needs to know how many RPMs the engine is running. So it's going to send out a remote transmission request frame onto the bus with an identifier which is referring to RPMs. And I'm just using some example here. This is the bit string 11 bits. And it's going to send this on the canvas. The RTR is one because we are talking about the remote transmission request frame. The control field, well, the first bit is a zero because the identifier is 11 bits wide. The second one is the delimiter. And then we have the four axes which are defining the data field length and the data field length here in a transmission request frame is zero. There's no data in it. And then, of course, we have our standard CRC, AC, EOF, and IFS. So what happens? The IC instrument cluster is going to send the data out and say, please send me the data of CAN ID 01111011001, which is basically the RPM. Now, any device on the bus that has that information will then respond back. Most likely there will be the ECU and it will send the standard CAN data frame with a CAN ID of 01111011001 plus the actual data of the RPMs and then the instrument cluster Ike will receive that and it will update the actually dial or the RPM gauges on the dashboard. That's how simple that is. Now let's look at the error frame. And the error frame is a very short frame. We have what we call an error flag and what we have what we call an error delimiter. Now the error flag is six bits wide and it can be an active error or it can be a passive error. And depending on what it is, we're gonna send zeros or ones. Now a passive error typically indicates that the device has exceeded its amount of errors, but it's still on the bus. So the way this works is that one a CAN controller is detecting errors in a data frame it received and it will immediately send out an error frame across the bus and everybody else on the bus will then discard that specific data frame and most likely there will be a retransmission and the last frame we need to look at is the overload frame and the overload frame looks almost identical to the um, error frame so you probably wonder now, well, how does the canvas controller and all this knows what to do with this? Well, the point is that in our example before, the instrument cluster was detecting a received wrong data frame. But not in this case. It, it received the data frame fine, but it's just too busy with updating its own internal stuff. So it's requesting on the bus, please uh, slow down because I'm too busy. And that's why it's sending an overload frame. And then the ECUs and the TCUs in this case, they will receive the overload frame and they do know that the previous message was not received in error. And then they will delay the next transmission. So folks, thank you for viewing and I'll see you in my next video. Bye bye. And by all means, please comment, right? Because I do love to get comments.